You know, 2020 was a weird year in a lot of ways, including how it had an impact on the movie and cinema industry, and we ended up with a lot of questions as a result. Are movie theaters going to survive? Is streaming going to be the new standard for how movies are distributed? Will the upcoming years see a dip in quality of films due to the filming delays and changes that had to be made because of the virus? A ton happened and it left a lot of doubt and uncertainty for what the next year would bring. However, my gays and gamers, I am here to spread the good news. Because on January 1st, 2021, the dawn of a new era emerged and a shining beacon of hope and joy was blessed upon humanity in the form of Shadow in the Cloud. As the end credits rolled for the movie, I knew that I could rest easy after the hell that was 2020 and that this was a sign that there was much to look forward to in 2021. That didn't last long. Shadow in the Cloud, starring Chloe Grace Moretz, directed by Roseanne Liang, is an absolute experience. And I implore you, if you have not seen it, please go and watch it completely blind because it is just so much better if you have no idea what you're getting yourself into. Consider this your spoiler warning. I'm also going to ask that you bear with me while I try to summarize this because it is going to sound like the ramblings of a crazy person just trying to describe the plot. So what is it? Simply put, it is feminism. This is the feel-good girl power movie of the decade. The movie starts with an animation that is trying its best to look like those old World War II instructional cartoons, despite very clearly being vector animation, a technology that totally existed in the 30s and 40s. Also, it just looks done by an animation student, but that's not really here nor there. What's important is that there is mention of something called a gremlin, though it's pretty clear that the gremlin is more of a metaphorical thing than anything else, telling the troops that gremlins will mess with their focus and their work and that kind of thing. We then cut to our main character, Maud Garrett, a soldier and pilot in World War II, as she cracks the lid open of some sort of parcel, and I can only assume it contains whatever was in the Pulp Fiction briefcase, given the golden light that emits from within. She hops onto a plane called the Fool's Errand with a large pinup girl on the side that you are very much meant to scoff at. Once on the plane, she meets the very skeptical all-male crew. She informs them that their commanding officer has ordered her on the flight and she is to deliver the package with her that contains something very top secret and only she is to have it and know its contents. Most of the crew immediately decide to act like the biggest douchebags humanly possible and harass her and make all sorts of lewd and sexist comments at her and they also decide to be racist towards the plane's co-pilot. They decide to stick her in the turret at the bottom of the plane until they figure out what's going on, but won't let her take the package with her, and she instead leaves it with one of the men who actually tried to stick up for her and told the others to knock it off. And this is the basic premise for how we continue for a while. She's in the turret, she can communicate with the men via the radio system on the plane, and they continue to harass and belittle her. She does try to stick up for herself, but they just laugh her off. 
Oh yeah, and they also do some sort of information request about her from their base to figure out what's up with this whole top secret mission that they didn't know about thing. Okay, so during all of this part of the movie, I was actually kind of into it and intrigued by it. It existed in that nebulous void that movies do sometimes, where for the first half hour or so, it's not too bad and it's not too great yet, but at any second you feel like it could take a sharp turn one way or the other. Most of the characters so far are just cartoonishly assholes, and it feels clunky for the sake of plot, but not in a way that's too distracting. The movie looks nice enough, and it has successfully created enough suspense that I was into it and I wanted to keep going. So then Maud sees a shadow. In the cloud. Thank you. Thank you. I'm here all week. She calls it out on the radio, but most of the dudes are like, Oh, the little woman soldier thinks she saw something, boys, and they just blow her off. Eventually, they decide to pull her out of the turret, but it gets jammed and she is rightfully miffed about that. And the guys decide to cut off her comms completely because the woman is being over-emotional, leaving her completely alone and cut off in the turret, further solidifying how most of them are just the absolute worst. In perfect cinematic timing, she then spots an enemy Japanese fighter and we hit one of those sharp turns that I was talking about. Because this motherfucker shows up. All right. She takes a gun out of her now revealed to be fake arm sling and fires. The dudes, of course, hear the gunshot and open comms back up to question her. She doesn't want to tell them what she saw for obvious reasons. And for some reason, she drops her New Zealand accent and it's revealed that she's actually an American. I don't know if Chloe Grace Moretz just couldn't keep doing it or if, I, you know, it doesn't matter. Moving on. So now the men are like super suspicious of her. Their information request has also conveniently come back at this time and they can't seem to find any records of her existing. So they try to take her out of the turret to question her. But she jams it and in true girl boss fashion, snipes the enemy plane that has now come back to the amazement of the crew. She explains to them that Garrett was her maiden name because she was actually married and put on the whole show for the sake of secrecy or something. Well, now the boys really want to know what's up with the whole package. She tells them, no, don't do it, and that you'll totally get court-martialed if you do. Uh, surprise, surprise, they do it anyways. And in the package is... like right right that's plot twist number one it is not the only plot twist in this scene give me the baby back finch no sir give me my baby remember that dude who was actually nice to her and offered to watch the package for her turns out that's her baby daddy he's not her husband though so she reveals the whole tragic story and plan to the crew her husband was an abusive asshole, and she fell in love with Quaid, his name is Walter Quaid by the way, and she got pregnant by him, and someone ratted her out to her husband about the baby, and she was convinced that he might kill or hurt both of them. So she faked the paperwork and got sedatives from a nurse to knock the baby out for a while, and I guess conveniently wore off right as they opened the box to see what's inside, it's not important. And she planned on skipping town to start a new life when they got to the plane's destination of Samoa. The captain is like, yeah, you two were totally under arrest, and starts to head back to the airbase when more Japanese fighters show up and attack the plane. And if you thought all of that rambling was crazy, you have no fucking idea what's about to hit you. Cause the gremlin that Maud had seen sabotaging the plane and crawling in after it attacked her, also decides to attack baby daddy and just kidnaps the baby in the satchel and brings it outside of the plane. So now our heroine has to deal with a ship under attack and a monster stealing her baby and oh yeah, the turret is starting to fall off the plane. This movie is the cinematic equivalent of doing a line. It goes from zero to a hundred really quick. 
this next sequence is the greatest series of events to ever grace cinema, and I will say that with full confidence. Maud climbs out of the turret and fires at the gremlin, and it runs off but leaves the baby dangling precariously from a pipe at extreme risk of falling off. She climbs across the underside of the plane while it's being shot at in the most professionally chroma keyed scene ever and manages to hook the baby and sling it on her back. Also in true girl boss fashion, she also apparently gave birth to an invincible baby because that bitch is being jostled beyond anything reasonable a baby should be subjected to. The turret is now very gone and she has to climb into the wing where the gremlin broke in earlier and manages to get back inside. We then see every man who was a sexist and racist asshole to her and the co-pilot die in the most hilariously gruesome ways, one by one, very satisfying to watch. And then, it happens. This is the exact moment that I knew that this was a 10 out of 10 film. It is so bonkers and balls to the walls that I am given no choice not only to respect it, but to admire it. Eventually, all of the absolute douchebags are dead, including the captain, and the Japanese fighters are no more, but the plane is in a nosedive and that is a bad thing. So Mon jumps in the pilot seat and has the most absolute gigabrain 4000 IQ plan. We roll through. What? We roll through to 180. Then a nose down and a nose up. It'll get us out of the dive. So, you know, outside of common sense, I actually know a bit about aviation because I went to an aerospace academy for high school. And I can confirm this is not how that works. Um, allow me to demonstrate. Alrighty, so this is an airplane that I very clearly spent several hours modeling just by just how gorgeous it is. So, anyways, this is your airplane, and that's that. That's not how that's supposed to happen. Hang on. Okay, if this is your airplane, and it is in a nosedive, and you understandably want to no longer be in a nosedive, and your solution is to roll the plane, which means you want to rotate it along like the length of the body if you if you do that do you see the issue <laughs> um the nose is not now magically pointing up that you've flipped the plane upside down now realistically it wouldn't turn like this tightly on an axis it would like turn and come up a little bit, just in kind of like a little bit more of a loop instead of just like a single point. But yeah, it, no matter what, if we go off the logic they use in the movie, that nose plane is- <laughs> nose plane. That plane's nose is definitely still pointing downwards and absolutely would solve none of their problems that they are having. In conclusion, they should all be dead, but of course they won't be. They still have a pretty rough landing and shit is on fire, which is not good given the oxygen on board and the survivors abandon ship just before it all explodes and erupts into flame. The super baby doesn't have anything wrong with it and everyone else is just a little beat up, but don't worry, it's not over yet because the second best part in this entire movie is coming up. The gremlin is back and just really determined to get this baby for some reason. I assume to eat it so that it can absorb its superpowers of invincibility or something? Cause while everyone else is caught off guard, it takes off with the baby. But no matter how fast the gremlin is, Super Mom is faster and she sonic speeds over and gets into a fucking brawl with this thing. That concludes with her breaking its own arm and stabbing it to death with its own claw. Yas queen! All this while the men just stand and watch. You'd think they'd try to help her or something, but I guess they knew the power of estrogen and plot armor were going to be enough for her to win easy peasy. After the thing is good and dead, we hear the baby crying. And given this baby only cries when the plot demands it, I knew instantly 
that it was hungry and she was gonna whip it out and feed the kid and that was going to be the final girl power moment of the film. And I was correct. However, I missed an extremely crucial detail. Because as she is feeding the baby, she looks over and the camera pans to the pinup girl on the side of the plane dramatically burning away. And that's it. The movie's over. And it is spectacular. If I talk about it objectively, it's not that good. Um, but holy shit is it fun. It does not give a shit about how weird and ridiculous it can be. Logic be damned, we are here for a fun time. And a fun time does it deliver. To me, this is something like teeth, and I do plan on making a video about teeth, but it's just one of those things that transcends all known and expected laws of filmmaking to the point that I don't care how little it makes sense because wow, there is a lot in this movie that does not make sense glowing baby at the beginning, there is a plane that straight up disappears right in front of her, and I thought that that was going to factor into the plot again later, uh, but it doesn't. It's just a disappearing plane that's there to be spooky or something. The gremlin's existence isn't explained or explored even a little bit, it is just an obstacle in the way to be eliminated. And we are meant to just go along with it. Baby Daddy seems to know that it's his baby, but then there's a line where Maude apologizes to him for not telling him about the baby. Or maybe she was apologizing to him for not telling her about the plan, I actually need to go and check that. He left me when I told him that I was married, which I understand, but I didn't tell him that I was pregnant. Physics are non-existent. Characters are one-dimensional. It has all the hallmarks of a cheesy, enjoyable B-action movie. The main character is also just a perfect specimen of humanity who has no flaws and does no wrong. Uh, though it's kind of funny because I had been thinking about this not too long before watching the movie. Typically when you have a character that is a Mary Sue or a Gary Stu, depending on the sex of the character, people are typically more willing to give the Gary Stu's a pass. And I don't think it's just because of sexism on the parts of the viewers, but because Gary Stu's are typically very active characters in the plots, while a lot of Mary Sue's are written very passively, at least in terms of the popular movies. If you're going to have a character with little to no flaws or struggles, you have to at least make them active so that their actions drive the plot forward and keeps them interesting. Maud Garrett is a very active Mary Sue. And for that, like so many of the Garys before her, I am more than willing to give her a pass. She is the self-insert female power fantasy character to rival all the male power fantasy characters we usually get. It's not nuanced in its messaging about sexism or empowerment at all. It is very much male gay sexy ladies bad and woman kick butt too, while also bearing the children. There are also several times that the movie tries to be strangely artsy. Gee, I can't imagine why that might be. I will say this is definitely the most enjoyable Max Landis film that I've seen and ascends way above Bright. Bright is like so bad you can laugh at it, but you never really get to the point of actually enjoying it unironically. Shadow in the Cloud, I actually enjoyed. And the fact that it seems to be trying so hard beyond what it has any business trying to do just enhances the entire thing. Despite it being crazy, it is still well paced and action packed and it basically demands interest from its audience. In a way kind of like soap operas do but with a lot more explosions. So if you are at this point in the video, I hope you've already seen it. But if not, please consider it, especially if you just love to watch cheesy ass movies. I honest to god love every minute of this mess and I will be watching it again. I highly recommend it. Hey, so now it's time for me to explain where the hell I have been for the last several months and what's going to happen moving forward. I plan on being back much more permanently this time and bringing some new things to the channel. As far as where I was, I ended up getting pretty overwhelmed with school and personal life. I won't go into all the gritty details here, but I really just needed time to myself for a while. If you're new here, you might also know that I have been dealing with a certain recent drama situation that I probably won't be talking about on this channel because it doesn't really have a place here. But as 
far as what's new, art streams. I'm going to start streaming here on YouTube while I work on various art projects. Some of them will be for videos, others for personal projects, though I also plan on redrawing the still soon and that will be one of the first things I do here. Hopefully you also noticed an increase in the editing quality because I have been spending some time properly learning editing softwares and I plan on bringing what I have learned into the channel. I don't have an exact upload schedule in mind for videos but I want to shoot for at least once a week starting out and maybe we can increase from there. We shall see. As the channel keeps growing I have plans to fire up a discord server and a patreon but that's a little bit more of a down the road goal. So yeah that's what I've got going on and I really hope you guys are as excited for it as I am and I really hope to see you around. Feel free to subscribe and follow my socials in the description down below Um, and I hope you all have a great day. See ya!